Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Welcome to any visitors. If you are here with us, we are always grateful to have you come worship our God together with us. Um, it was good to begin Advent this morning. Thank you to the fans. Uh, as we seek to prepare our hearts to remember that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father. So I want to encourage you to redeem this season as we prepare our hearts for this great um, doctrine and reality and truth that Jesus Christ entered the world to save sinners among who I am foremost. I wanted to ask you to be praying for a dear friend, um, Fred and Logan Lee. Um, she's been diagnosed with a kind of an autoimmune where her, her immune system is turning on her and it's going into her nerves. And it's a, a very painful thing. Usually they, they say when you come in, you're in a wheelchair, it'll paralyze you. And because she's not paralyzed, she's feeling the pain uh, intensely uh, in her nerve system. And uh, if it travels into your lungs, it, it can be a very dangerous thing. And so they're sitting there saying it's different with every person. We, don't, we can't tell you what's going to happen or where it's going to go. And they got a little baby. And uh, they just they need their, their church family. Um, their, their families live in different states. And uh, I think her parents were able to come down from Wyoming. But... Uh, they, they need our love and help to get them through this time. They say it usually will take nine months to work through your body. So uh, nine months at least of uh, this battle. So we'll be praying for them. Let's lift them up together right now. Father, we pray for the Lee family, and we thank you for how dear they've become to our own hearts. Lord, they've loved this body well, and our hearts hurt for them in the middle of this trial. And God, you love to draw near when we're in these kind of trials, you're so present. You're so a uh, very present help in the time of trouble when our foundations are rocked. There is one who is steadfast, a tower, a strong tower, a place of refuge. I pray, Lord, by your spirit, lead them to that sweet place. Let them feel even now they're the safest people on the face of the earth because they're in Christ. They're in your will. They're in your plan and purpose. God, um, bless them, help them. Let, let their faith look this morning at the glories and the beauties of Christ and be encouraged and comforted in the midst of all that is going on in their lives right now. God, we thank you for them. Watch over their little son during this time as well. Uh, be with Fred. Give him enabling grace to shepherd his family and be with Logan. God, strengthen her in this time. We pray that you would even bring uh, a miracle into her life that the doctors would say it's never cleared out of a body this fast in their history. God, do abundantly more than we could hope or think for that family, we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, this Friday, I want to remind you one more time, is our Christmas concert, and it's going to be a special time of focusing on the Lord's rest and worshiping, and the gospel will be proclaimed, so we encourage you. Um, there's been so much work put in to do this in an honoring way to God, and it has come together in a beautiful way. And so do the work of the evangelists and get out and invite unbelievers to come hear the gospel. And, and then just as a family, this is our privilege to gather together on a Friday night to slow down as Peter talked about and to just focus on the rest that Christ has brought for us. So encourage the family to come worship with us on Friday night. Um, one thing I forgot to do, um, I was so excited about John 15, 1, and abiding in Jesus Christ that I, I forgot something. And I love when I forget things because I'm lost in wonder, love, and praise. But I forgot that um, Logan and Abby were getting married. And I just love praying, you know, as new marrieds, when we have new babies, new marrieds, graduating high school, college. We try to just always bring people up to, as a congregation to pray for them. And so if you guys don't mind coming up and letting me pray over you. So... I wanted to give you a warning, but you might have said no. So, so I was just glad you were here. That would have been terrible. <laughs> All right. Well, God bless Logan and Abby. Um, the wedding was so beautiful, and I think those who were there saw just the love that God has put in their hearts for him and for each other, and it just it was a beautiful time. And Let's all join our hearts together with our, our commitment to help them stay hand in hand, growing in Christ till they die. And, and um, just we want to come alongside and be with them and 
present them to God. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Logan and Abby. God, thank you for, I just rejoice in the way you have brought them together and knit their hearts in love for you and love for each other. God, I pray that you will be with them in the journeys now because of remaining sin. God, dwelling together in one house can have great joys and great difficulties. And I just pray for this abundant grace that is available in you to deepen them in their love, purify them, sanctify them by this marriage. Grow them to be useful. Let their marriage be a conduit of grace. God, don't let them uh, hold it for themselves, but to, to take this blessed bond and to proclaim Jesus with all they can until they breathe their last. God, thank you for them and their love for this body and the way that they've served it. Bless them, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love you, buddy. Happy birthday. Oh, man. <laughs> Happy birthday. How old are you, Logan? 26. 26. <clears throat> Me too, brother. <laughs> Why do you laugh? <laughs> um, and then Christine and Nathan got married yesterday as well, and I just want to congratulate the O'Hare family on the beauty of that as well. Well, this morning, if you'll turn to John chapter 15, uh, we're blessed to partake of the Lord's table uh, together uh, today. One of, one of my favorite Lord's Day is to just slow down, and, and I love sitting shoulder to shoulder with the saints, and we have this, this union and this faith in Jesus Christ, and, and we just come and we look again at what he has done to purchase our redemption and so it's the, the two ordinances that Jesus left for us, baptism and the Lord's table. And today we get to partake of that. So I want to prepare our hearts for the table. And so we're going to just continue in our study in John 15. It's very uh, fitting for the Lord's table. So this is part three of the vine and the branch. Uh, let me just read it to you again. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. Without Jesus, you dry up and they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they're burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father's glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. This morning, we will look at this in verse 9. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Father, we come before you and I pray that that would be the fruit of this morning, that our joy would be made full in what we have in Christ. God, I pray that you will use these words. Um, I tremble at the beauty of them and I'm asking by your spirit to let every believing mind and heart comprehend them this morning and that they would be taken up and the love of Christ, and that it would be transformational in the day-to-day -day life. Nothing more practical than living in the love of Christ. And I pray that you would overcome a million sins that are represented in this room by this love. I pray, Father, that you would help us comprehend it. And if any have walked in here and have never known the love of Christ, that this morning you would shed abroad in their hearts the love of God in Christ Jesus, that it would break in and they would finally understand this gospel. 
God, no human could do any of these things. And so we look only to you. Jesus, I pray, just let me be a branch, an ambassador. Speak through me by your spirit and your word right into the hearts of souls that they would know that the living Christ is speaking to them. Let this be supernatural and let this be worship. God, transcend the natural and do more than we could hope or think this morning in our time of worship. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been considering how to grow in Christ. The new covenant is designed to bring about that fruit. We have what's called initial sanctification where you get saved and to be sanctified is to be set apart and you are now set apart from this world to God. And then we have what's called progressive sanctification where God begins to change you and conform you into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to the next. And then we have ultimate sanctification, which is when we breathe our last and stand in the presence of Christ, our position will match our practice and we will shine like the noonday sun. We are going to be perfectly righteous. Ultimate sanctification is a coming. And as we have seen then, fruit bearing is the, the focus of this section. This is what Jesus is after as he's meeting with his disciples and the night in which he's going to be betrayed. And so the father in verse 2 it says he prunes branches so that you might bear more fruit. In verse 5, he says he does it so that you might bear much fruit. In verse 7, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And the context is bearing fruit. Ask God and he's going to do the fruit that you're wanting to see in your life and in the lives of others. Verse 8, this is where the Father's glorified that you bear much fruit and show and prove that you're my disciples. That's how God gets glory. Verse 11, this amazing fruit, he says, will make your joy full. As fruit is growing on your limbs, your joy is going to be made full because it's coming from Christ. And then in John 15, 12, I just want to read that. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends, if you do what I command you, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father, I've made known to you, friends. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain. It stays, it abides, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he might give to you fruit bearing. And so this I command you, the most beautiful fruit there is, is that you love one another. This was the verse at your wedding. It just, boom, I loved it. Sorry, you distracted me when I saw you. <clears throat> so the fruit of love will remain. So the question, how do I bear this fruit? I've been asking this, just begging God, how do I bear this fruit? I hope every one of your hearts are, I want to bear fruit. And the first way we learned is apart from me, you can do nothing. Fruit bearing begins with people who die to their own fruit bearing. I can produce nothing in me. I can do nothing. And that is where fruit is going to begin. And I've always said this, we'll do anything except nothing. And fruit's going to begin with, I can't, I, I can't make wax fr real fruit. I can just make the wax stuff. And then second, the way fruit's going to come is you abide in me. It's a command of Jesus. Our relationship to Christ is the key to it all. We are joined to Christ when we come to faith. And it's like a vine and a branch. And Jesus says, I'm the true vine. I'm the vine that will produce the fruit that Israel couldn't produce. I'm the real one. And the life of Christ will flow into branches called believers. You this morning. And it's going to bear fruit. It's going to bear fruit. This is so beautiful. In John 14, just the chapter before, the, he says the Holy Spirit's going to, I'm going to send him and he's going to dwell in you, believer in Christ. He's going to dwell in you. His nature is going to come into your very soul. The life of God is going to come into our soul. So his, his nature here 
And it's so intimate that the life of Christ comes into your person, your being, your, your life, your soul. This is, this is so big. And as, I, as I've said many times, Christianity is not just taking up a set of rules. I'm going to live this way. I'm going to live, uh, love your neighbor as yourself or, or a system of belief. It's just all Christianity is a system of doctrines. But it's regeneration and it's being replanted into a new stem. It's being planted into Jesus Christ by grace through faith in his work. And so you are brought into this oneness with Christ. And so as we begin, I just want to start with application instead of at the end. Give up small resolutions. I'm afraid we're living with sins and weaknesses and shame and guilt that we can overcome by the true vine. Please hear that. Our focus tends to be, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I walk around my whole life just, you can do nothing, and I stay there. That's the beginning of fruit bearing. But you got to go to where I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I'm joined to the vine. That, that is no small thing. You're joined to Jesus Christ. What power is available to us by faith in Christ? So much so that Jesus is saying, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to bear much fruit. You're going to bear fruit if you will stay and abide and remain in this beautiful relationship that I've purchased for you. Get, get away from me. Get into your own strength. Try to produce your own fruit. And you will. You'll despair. And you'll never make progress. And you'll give up. And you'll live a defeated Christian life. So the context, ask whatever you want and it'll be given to you. And so I just sit and go, if you're despairing this morning, go to the vine and ask. Abide and, and, and what is available is the joy of Christ to come into me. We learned two weeks ago um, with forgiveness. And, I, and I'm just bitter and gnarly and I've put everything on the shelf and I say I've forgiven, but I haven't. I, I, can, I can go and ask of God and abide in Christ. And forgiveness is going to flow when it's 70 times 70 of what he's forgiven you. And if you're angry, there's a way that abiding can make you peaceable. If you're anxious, it can bring peace. And I want you to see what is available to you. So ask yourself, Christian, have you given up on yourself? Have you given up on what Christ can do in you? Are you cynical? Are you content? Just, I'm, I'm not going to bear any fruit, and that's just the reality of it. If I can just get out of bed, pastor, it's a good day. And I'll tell you, there are seasons of winter for sure. Someone prayed that in our prayer group this morning. But the spring is coming, and the spring, as I abide in Christ, it's It's harvest. So what stain is so deep in your life that the life of Christ cannot take it out? And one other thought is I think it's just as wrong to give up on others. We tend to look at other people kind of, these are good people, these are dysfunctional people, these are toxic, non-toxic, uh, rather as branches that are attached to the vine, the true vine. And anyone who's attached to the true vine, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a kid, it's a friend, Anything's possible. Just, we don't give up. And so what I want to call you to is don't treat yourself as, a, as if you cannot change in Christ and stop treating others as if they can't change. And so what we should do with us and others then to do this is the command I want to come back to is abide. That's the, the key to this passage, Abide. Abide. And there are four things in this passage I want to consider as we've already looked at three of them, two of them. Abide is the just shall live by faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And I'm, I'm going to live by faith. Okay? So abide in me. Uh, John 15, 1. I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And what I just, as I keep meditating on this, what keeps jumping out as I, as I remain in this relationship with Christ, um, I have this father who's pruning me. Any of you get tired of the dead, dead branches on your branches? And he, 
comes and he, he prunes them so that you might bear more fruit. And maybe he's doing that in your life right now. He's been snipping me everywhere. It hurts. But it's synergistic because the Father prunes and it, it makes you go to Jesus. I can't get through this without Jesus. So th- th- it's just so synergistic that I have a vine that I have all vitality, all life, all sufficiency, and this Father is pruning the things that got to come off that are hurting me and c- causing me not to bear fruit. And he comes in your life and he messes with it and he prunes the things that are killing you. And then what it is is not to, to get bitter and angry, but it's, it's to go to the vine and say, Christ, I, I need your help with this day and this trial and the things I'm battling and the, the hopes that have been dashed, and I need Christ. And so I just, this is just so beautiful that you have a vine that you're attached to, the life of Christ, and a father pruning you so you'll go deeper into Christ. That's why he's pruning you. Go to Christ. Abide and let my words abide in you. Believe the word of God. Believe its promises. I, I, I always say I hate to have to tell the church again, believe the promises of God. Let it, let it dwell in you. Let the words of Christ dwell richly in you. Let, let them come and take over and fill us with the hope of what is revealed in this Bible. Then abide in prayer. Ask whatever you want. This will change your prayer life. As you are just letting Christ fill you and his word fill you, you're going to be praying all the right things. My prayer life, I'm seeing him do things that I, I, I'm just amazed at right now. Because you're, you're praying the right things. It, it's not always just make them better. Let them drink of the vine like they've never drank before. And I'm watching him answer that. I'm watching him do things that are unbelievable. And I just want you to know that as you do that, he'll bear much fruit because whatever you ask of him through this word and abiding in Christ, he says, you'll have it. That's a blank check. Go change the world through prayer and abiding. And then abide in my love. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. This is the soil in life that abundant fruit will grow up. Abide in me. Let my words abide in you, abide in prayer, and abide in my love, and you're going to bear much fruit. So let's take it up this morning. Abide in my love. (laughs) Put on your seatbelts. Verse 9. Just as the Father has loved me. Martin Lloyd-Jones says the greatest need of the church when he wrote this is to know the love of Christ. One of the godliest men who've ever lived and revival broke out in the Welsh areas. One of the greatest needs of the church is to know the love of Christ. We, contemporary church talks about the love of Christ daily and they never talk about the love of Christ. We're gonna look at what is the real, true love of Christ. Abide in it. He said the highest attainment in the Christian life is to know the love of Christ. It's the sweetest and most comfort of all blessings. Spurgeon said, it's the center of God's salvation. In it, we find our best joy. And Jesus said, abide in it that your joy might be made full. Let's continue in this metaphor then this morning of a vine and a branch. So as we jump in, the metaphor changes a little bit here because Jesus is addressing something that the metaphor I think came short of. That metaphor of a vine and branch was perfect to show the life of the vine and the branches, the sustaining, the bearing the fruit, the pruning. It was a brilliant metaphor. But there's one last piece that Jesus wants to make sure on this evening with his apostles that you don't miss. And vines don't love the branches. He's going to just take it even deeper as I've shown you the sufficiency of the vine and how beautiful it is. I want to go one step further. This vine that you're joined to and dependent on and stay in, Loves you with an unconditional love that you'll never be able to grasp the sight of glory. Abide in his love. Mm. Don't just abide in my life, but abide in my enjoyment and my love for you. This takes it to a whole other level, brothers and sisters. I didn't think it could get better, but what it's saying this morning is so good. 
don't, I don't want to just be married, but blissfully and joyfully married and enraptured in Christ. Let's go to a deeper level this morning. And I just want you to hear verse 9. Just as the Father has loved me. This is a reality that has to be embraced and believed and trusted in. This is the reality that the children of God are to live in. Abide in it. Just as the Father has loved me. This is the love that the Father has for the only begotten Son. The one he said, you are daily my delight. The infinite, amazing love between Father and Son cannot be grasped. And Jesus here says, the love that I have for you is the same love that the Father has for me. I have loved you with the same love that I and the Father share. Abide in it. There's no other love like this. It is such a unique love between the Father and the Son. Most of us marvel at it and just wish that we could be loved like that. And I want you to hear these two words, just as. Put it on my tombstone, baby. Just as. Put it on your refrigerators, your car mirrors, your shirts. I don't even care if you tattoo it on your chest. Just as. Jesus is inviting every believer to climb into this eternal well of love just as. And he wants you to bathe in it all day long. He wants you to abide in it. Abide in just as. Just flip back to John 13, 1. He's, now we're in the upper room, and this is the first statement in the upper room. Before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. John turned to John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that also you love one another. And by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And turn over to John 17, one of the greatest prayers that Jesus ever prayed that was recorded for us. Look at verse 22. Jesus prays, he says, Father, the glory which you have given me, I've given to them, and, and they may be one just as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I've known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. <clears throat> this is so good. As Jesus is saying this, the wine press that he's about to tread is in progress. The cross that he must carry is less than 24 hours away. And he says, oh, how he has loved them. And he has. And the intimacy of his love at the, mo at the moment of this upper room is rich. And so this love is, I uh, just meditating on it this week. It's a love without bounds. Listen to Paul in Ephesians 3. He says, I pray that you might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you might be filled up with all the fullness of God. It's immeasurable. I, I pray that you would know this love. It was a love that began in eternity past. Paul said in Ephesians 1, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us. It was while you were enemies, God demonstrates his own love to us, and that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. 
It's a love with no bounds. It has no beginning and no end. Do you believe this? Because God's word declares it so. It's an everlasting love. What depths would this love go to for me? Well, it, it went from what we just talked about this morning, from heaven to earth, an incarnation to a, a, a baptism, identifying with sinful humanity. To a grave. What, what level will this love stoop? And what heights will it ascend to? Well, it will take me right up into glory for all of eternity. You can measure every other love, but this one is infinite. And so it's incomparable in its graciousness. It was unsought, it was unbought, unmerited, unearned, and it was given to you freely. It's without measure. It's grace upon grace in John 1.16. It just keeps coming, layers and layers, an ocean of grace upon grace. He withholds nothing. He, it washes feet. The, he said, if, if the Lord, the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's. It'll, it'll get down and wipe feet. It's a generous love. It just gives and gives and gives, and it's never diminished or it doesn't need to be replenished. The, the, it's a immutable love. It, it's a love that cannot change. It's what we've been looking for our whole lives. You're, you're trying to find it in humans. You spend all your days, I, I want this love that is infinite and cannot change. We're just looking for it on every turn. And here it is. Abide in it unconditional, unchanging, immutable love. It's a sacrificial love as we're going to go to the table. John 10, for this reason, the Father loves me because I laid on my life that I might take it up again. It's an indestructible love. Our sin cannot quench his love. I want you to believe that. My sin cannot quench this love. My dullness my distractedness, my indifference cannot dampen the love of Christ for me. It can be tried, but never lost. I can't get over it just as. The Father has loved me. I have also loved you. you. You should just be jumping up giddy right now. Some of you look like you want to go to sleep. He loves you just as the Father has loved him. And then comes the command. So abide in my love. It's an imperative. Dwell in my love. What a command is being given to you this morning. This separates Christianity from all world religions right here. Because every other religion says, earn my love. Merit my favor. Go do things. And this is the only one. The whole world is, you got to earn people's love. We, we dwell in it every day. And now we hear from the lips of Christ, my commandments are not burdensome. Abide in my love. Child of God, abide. Live into the blessed consciousness of this love by faith in his word. Live into it. Abide in it. Don't leave it. Don't say, yeah, yeah. Stay in it daily. Turn it over and look at it from every angle of scriptures. You've been given the Holy Spirit to help you know this love. Reflect on it. The reality, the glorious reality of this truth, the love of Christ for me. This is ground zero of the Christian life. Try to live the Christian life without this and you're failing, I'll guarantee it. I spent 10 years trying to do that. It stinks, okay? The love of Christ, it's the foundation stone. Dwell in the preciousness of it. Uh, 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 Newton, I was reading, he's, he's your shepherd. This Christ wants to shepherd you. He's your husband. He's a prophet. He, he speaks to you. He, he, he's a priest. He died to cleanse you. He's a king to rule you. And he's your friend. No greater love than this. He's your friend. And, and I've tested this friendship. He should not be my friend. I've blown it. It's just like... What a friend we have in Jesus. I love that title. Newton said that was his favorite one of Christ, that he's your friend. He sticks closer than a brother. Live into it, my friends. John calls himself in this gospel the disciple whom Jesus loved. I just want to walk around and say, I'm the disciple who Jesus loved. 
I want to get this so deep that that's what comes out of me. I'm the one that Jesus loves. Live into the glory and the confidence of this love. Abiding in him, not just a vine, but the one who loves you with the love that the Father has for him and he has for the Father. Abide. All is removed that made him not be able to draw near in love to you. How can I know he loves me? Because my sin was dealt with on the cross. All of it. And the righteousness that he wants to dwell in his presence, he's given to me and his own son. Now he can love me fully. And because I'm in Christ, he can love me just as the father loves the son. It just pulls everything away from everything we've ever known. He can love me because I'm in Christ. I'm clothed in perfection. My sin has been removed as far as we heard. The east is from the west. Guys, now you can abide in his love where before you were under his wrath. Abide in this love because justification, it's the only way to get fruit is to live into this blessed truth that you are forgiven and justified before God and declared righteous. He does not love you, hear this, because of the depth of your sanctification. Do you believe that? The only way he can love you is because you're in Christ. And as we learned, it's infinite. It can't change. It doesn't grow. It doesn't diminish. He loves you. He loves you because he has chosen to love you in Christ. Tim Keller said the Christian life is a relationship with God that produces greater obedience, not a life of obedience that produces a greater relationship with God. So it's not me doing all these things to get closer. (laughs) I'm already in the vine because of what Jesus has done. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Abide in the blessedness of the love of Christ this morning. I was reading a hymn. George Matheson wrote a song, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. And this writer was engaged and he lost his vision and his fiance broke it off. And he had a sister, his only relative, who cared for him. And and he wrote this song when his sister was engaged and getting married and she was going to be going away. So he's left by himself. Where did he go when he was in such a hard time and a hard season of life? He said, oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thy ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O love that will not let me go. Abide in it. Dwell in it. Jesus, your love is better than life. Live in the captivation of it. Abide. And we saw, I'm going to just hit one thing and we'll go to the table. No, actually three things. Um, Abiding is is faith. So as you look and say, what, what is abiding? I heard one of the sweetest prayers this morning saying, I don't all the way get abiding, but some beams have broken in and God, would you just show me the noonday sun because I want to get this. And I pray that God would hear that sweet prayer right now. Abiding is re- living by faith into Christ. And I'm going to take some quotes from John Newton again to try to help us understand it. So he defines faith. He says this transformation of abiding, it works incrementally as the Christian gazes deeper into the mystery of Christ's redeeming love. And you just keep seeing it deeper and deeper and deeper. And he says as the Christian sees deeper into the glory of Christ's person, his offices, prophet, priest, and king, his grace, and his faithfulness, which I'm experiencing so deeply. And as the Christian perceives more of the divine excellencies of God in Christ. Look your eyes out. And now here's his definition of faith. I hope it helps that prayer. God, would you please help that sweet little prayer and for everyone else that needs the same thing right now, God. 
please let the beams break through what this faith is and how to abide. He says, faith is the effect of a principle of a new life implanted in the soul. So it, it's, it's given to you and it goes in the soul that was before dead in its trespasses and sins. Saw no beauty in Christ. And if it qualifies not only for obeying the Savior's precepts, but chiefly and primarily for receiving and rejoicing in his fullness, admiring his love, his work, his person, his glory, and his advocacy. It's basically looking to the fullness of who Christ is. And it makes Christ precious. That's what the gift of faith does. It awakens the taste buds to see that he's beautiful. And it makes him precious. And it enthrones him in the heart. And it presents him as the most delightful object to our meditations. As our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification and strength, our root, our head, our life, our shepherd, and our husband. It makes Christ altogether lovely. And he now is the center of my life and my heart. And then, then uh, Newton wrote a poem that said, but since the Savior I have known, my rules are all reduced to one. To keep my Lord by faith in view, the strengths, supplies, and motives too. To just keep my eyes on Christ by faith. And it gives me strength, and it gives me the motives to want to be pleasing to him. Amen? Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments <coughs> and abide in his love. And uh, so if you will abide in my commandments, if you make them your priority, your aim, and your ambition, you will abide in my love. And so this is where it gets tricky because it feels like abide in my love. And I just told you it's unconditional, can't change, can't merit. And all of a sudden the next verse says, keep my commandments, then you can abide in my love. It, it feels contradictory. And my goal this morning is to show you that it's married. So in John 14, 15, Brian preached on this a while back. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And now he's just explaining this further. So in the new covenant, what I love about it is commandment keeping flows out of our love to Christ, which flows from his love to us. Abide in it, receive it, and now it's going to flow out into life. And so Jesus said in John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Uh, that's the one who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my father just as, and I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. So as you abide in his love and, and in Christ, um, you, you keep his commandments and you, it's just this beautiful fellowship, communion. I'm going to reveal more of myself to you. Love is the basis for following Christ. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. We'll dwell with him. We'll have fellowship. We'll have, uh, as in 1 John, our fellowships with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and one another. You'll, you'll have this. And so if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Our obedience is our love to him. And I think this is what John meant in his epistles. He's using all these present tense verbs and he says, you can't be abiding in sin if you abide in him and his love. So he's saying these two will never work together. And so the, the, the way I, I'm in sin and abiding, he's saying if you're abiding in Christ, you're, you're just, it's going to bring repentance. It's going to bring confession. It's going to bring uh, communion and, and restoration. And so we, 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 we abide in Christ. Our obedience is our love to him. How do we show it? I want to walk in whatever pleases you and avoid whatever displeases you. That's the new birth. Love wants to be guided. I'll run in it. Anything you say, Jesus, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's, it's our side of the relationship. It's this mutual love. As I get the just as, the way the Father loved the Son, and, and my obedience is we're, we're just together as one. That's what John's saying. If you, if you walk in darkness, you, you've never seen him. 
It just it doesn't go together. These two can't work. So <laughs> it wants to be guided. And so get this, our love does not earn his love. His love produces obedience from the heart. And it's so big that our obedience or lack of it doesn't result in the rising and falling of his love. So it's a foundation you got to have. And, and as a pastor, I see not many people have this foundation really wired. Is that his love doesn't go up and down with my obedience. And so I, I begin in this abiding in his love, knowing that it's permanent. It doesn't change. I just bask in it. And that's going to produce what we're looking at. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. When you get that, what's going to come out of you is just abundant love for others and God. So his love burns at full heat all the time. It, it, it doesn't need kindling. Sometimes we think we got to bring offerings or do certain things to kindle his love. It's, it's at full heat, always and forever. The thermostat's turned up as high as it could go. Our obedience comes under this heat. Our obedience, oh, thank you. Our obedience allows us to enjoy it. So please don't miss this. My, my, one of my greatest motivations for obedience is if you love me and as I obey him, it's just this sweet, mutual fellowship and joy. So what could, what could you have a greater incentive to obey him than you get to enjoy him more? You get to have fellowship. You, you get the vine. You bear much fruit. It's not, a, it's not a sword, disobey and die. It's hands with holes in it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Our loving him and obeying him, our relationship is more enjoyed. What's the, what's the probably the worst time in your life is when you, you, you're not doing that. You got one foot in the world and one foot out. I, I think I could just ask for a show of hands. The sweetest moments in your life are when you're walking with Christ and obeying him. Like those are the moments like this is heaven on earth. And that's what he's promising here. What a marriage. Obedience is the working out of mutual affection. Abide in his love. I enjoy this love more by obedience to the one I love. So what a marriage. His love and our obedience, his will becomes mine. And they live happily ever after. Isn't this the love relationship with the Father and the Son? So I just want to jump to that. Jesus said, I always do the things that are pleasing to the Father. He, he, his will was to do the will of him who sent me. My bread is to do that. I love the Father. I do his will. I abide in the Father's love, and I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That's the beautiful uh, love relationship with obedience, love, affection that you've been brought into. And so it isn't anything new. It's what the Father and the Son have. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And we enter in, and it's the joy of this new covenant relationship. And we cry from this place of love and marriage with Christ. What can I do for the one who's done all things for me? This marriage, my friends, will bear much fruit. You'll have children everywhere. Fruit. You'll look like the Francos. You just boom. 13, 15 kids. Just, uh, fruit is just going to abound on your limbs if you get this. Man, I could go on all these forever, but we got to go to the communion table. So I'm going to close up with verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, and I think that's, uh, it could be the whole book, but I think it's John 15, 1 through 10, all the things we've been looking at. I've been speaking to you about abiding. And so these things I've been speaking so that my joy may be in you. So the intention is, I want my joy, the joy of Christ to be in you. And this is what brings Jesus joy. When we surrender to do his Father's will. When, when we abide and we, we show this mutual affection, if you love me, you keep my commandments. This is his joy. I, John said, I have no greater joy than when my children walk in the faith. I have no greater joy than when my children obey God. I have no greater joy than when you guys delight and walk in him. I pray that you would do the same as I do out of my love, Jesus says, that brings me joy. And so he's, he's, he's leading us to joy. And what I want you to get as we close, I mean it this time, the most miserable place to be, and, and I need you to listen to this, is being half in and half out 
in the kingdom of God. And I call that American Christianity, which I, I call false Christianity, fake. Just playing games. I'm going to give God a little here. I'm going to give the world a little here. You, you want the recipe to be miserable? Keep playing games with God. Don't enter into this beautiful, sweet place of abiding. And if you love me, keeping my commandments and all that's going to come from that. Keep, keep playing. Play around with it. And it's the recipe for no joy. I, I counsel it and I watch it in my own heart every day. You don't want joy? Play around with Jesus. Drink up this world and then try to just give him your leftovers on Sunday. You're miserable. You're not enjoying what I just painted. I, I, I'm... Oh. <laughs> one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, you will not find the fullness of joy. I'm a minister for your joy. You're not joyful. It's not working, is it? You'll not find it. You're the saddest people, and that's why I'm uh, the most despairing and no joy in that place. But I want you to hear Jesus this morning. This is, this is not to make you miserable, guys. I used to tell my kids they hated it. Guys, I'm just trying to make you as happy as a soul can be a million years from now. And they'd just be like, eh, I just, you know, it didn't seem to do what it did for me. And I just, I just want to tell them, since none of them are sitting here, except my boy Noah, um, it, it was wrong. It was partially wrong. I want to make you as happy as you can possibly be right now. So I want you to be happy a million years from now. That's why I preach Jesus. But I want you to be as happy as a soul can be this morning because of what you've been brought into and what we have in Jesus Christ and keep kicking and going away from it, and you will never have this joy. It grieves me. It grieves my own heart when I do it. Go away from what God's offering here. Jesus says, I give you my joy, and your joy will be made full. The joy of Christ will be springing up in your hearts, not bound by circumstances, but locked into this amazing place that we've been brought into. Abide in my love. I need to stop. I'll go over it a little bit next week. But I, there's one piece I can't stop. Is I, I grew up as a Christian where we got um, under abusive Christianity where the examination was 24-7, are you a Christian? And you had to look at every little piece of fruit for hours and hours. And we would invite people to the communion table. And it was a church of 500 and three people would come take communion because they, they all felt so unworthy. And, and so I've always been careful because I, I want to be a minister for your joy. But there's something hard I got to say before we end this passage. And as we're coming to the communion table, I think it's right to ask this. Holy Spirit, Make the right, just make the application. Don't let souls make this that shouldn't and souls that should not. Amen. So my hard question is this passage has been doing a work on me in beautiful, crushing ways. I just, sometime I'll share my testimony of what God's been doing. But I want you to do some examination with me as I've been praying hard over what I'm going to share right now. And study this week, and the fruit of the people that I've been around this week have been un unbelievable. I, I'm just overwhelmed with what Christ is doing in hearts in this body. I met with my brother Sam Swithers. Sam's a young man, and his mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, and three weeks later, she died on Thanksgiving, this Thanksgiving. And he's got younger siblings and all that that family's going through. And we sat in a coffee shop yesterday and, and all of his grief, his worship of Christ was so beautiful. And he found that he could go into the deepest grave and the love of Christ was deeper still. And I just praise God for that brother. I met with the Steffens when our dear sister Ruth passed instantly and suddenly and I've watched a faith come out of that family. God, it's indestructible. The love of Christ met them in their hardest time. Yesterday at a wedding, I got to talk to my brother Bob Schulte. 
And he just says, God has been so faithful to him since he lost his wife. And he said, he's just holding me. <laughs> the love of Christ is just holding me. I love you. And on came Friday night, the young disciples. What a beautiful assembly. And just was talking to Diane. She just was just giddy over, I just keep learning how faithful he is. And her love for him was just oozing out of her. And, and then I texted a widow yesterday and just said, how you doing? She texted back and said, I couldn't be better. I have my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't need anything more. The deepening of your faith and love for Christ and trust and the love that is coming out has just been so beautiful. It just makes me glory in the vine. It's no glory to humans. The vine is producing fruit in so many lives here this morning. But there's some sitting here this morning, and I'm going to say this out of love, love alone. You've been here a long time, and some even a short time. Your doctrinal grid has gotten sharper. But what I'm talking about this morning, for God, you know that you're a stranger to it. I'm not going to look up. You've become bitter and not better. It jumps out when you see what Christ is doing in other lives. Critical and not Christ-like. No luscious fruit on your vine, no delight in this just as the Father loves me. John 15, 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And in verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they're, they're burned. So something's wrong. Something's wrong. Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are you white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? Is his vital life flowing through your branches? Do you abide in his love? Are you producing fruit or fungus? This day, God has given you another opportunity to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To come to him. All the way to him that you might have life. And his life might flow through your life. I offer Jesus to you this morning freely. There was a fountain filled with blood and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Redeeming love has been my theme and it shall be till I die. We're going to come to the table. We're going to pass the cup and we're going to eat the bread. And what this is, is we're going to have fellowship with Christ and with one another. There's an organic relationship that we have with Christ through his death. And we're abiding in his love this morning as we look at the greatest manifestation of love. And maybe what you need to do this morning is cry out to him during this meal, I want you in a relationship. I'd rather die than not have this. Believe his love at this remembrance and call upon him for salvation. Maybe this morning as you take the bread and the cup, you've just been stagnant. You've lost your first love. But you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Let it awaken love. Let it awaken taste buds again for the beautiful Christ. If you've been abiding, let this fill you up and make your joy full as you remember what Jesus Christ <laughs> has done for you. This table is why you can't abide in him. It's why you can abide in his love. It's why you can abide in his word and prayer. And so shall we remember together in the presence of Christ, my friend who laid down his life for me and is now a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Let's pray. What wondrous love is this? 
I need the Holy Spirit, God. Be a floodlight, Holy Spirit. How do we ever get our arms around just as? How can we ever believe that we sit in that kind of love this morning? Only by your word and the Holy Spirit. For your word is true. And it's just so manifested from Genesis to Revelation. God, we've been brought to believe in your love. We're the, we're the beloved disciple of Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for such a gospel. And I thank you for what this love could do to set us free from a million sins, from some of the despairs and the things that we're sitting. Oh God, let us abide in a vine that loves us with an infinite love and draw from that and draw from the full sufficiency of Jesus Christ and let that bear much fruit for your namesake. God, thank you for the table. Come meet us now as we examine and take this time together to prepare our hearts. Amen.